Welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, a very special edition. Today, we are going to go deep cover with one of uh, America's most decorated former federal law enforcement officers, Herm Groman, good friend of mine. I've known him for probably about 15 years right now. And yeah, a long he's time. Salt of the earth. And I'm telling you, these guys don't get enough credit for what they do and what they did. And he was, he's also ex military, but um, he was, you know, worked for the, uh, in the FBI for 30 years, Herm? 25. 25 <clears throat> years and did. It felt like ser- did some serious <laughs> undercover work against some serious <laughs> organizations. Um, today, we're going to discuss about his time undercover in the Cleveland Mafia during the late 1970s when the Danny Green War erupted. Uh, it's from the, you know, you can see the movie Kill the Irishman, and uh, there's been a lot of stuff written about when Danny Green and his Irish Mafia tried to unseat the Italian Mafia led by uh, Jack Licavoli. Herm was, was, was right in the middle of it. So, Herm, tell us about get, you know going to Cleveland, getting into the OC uh, unit of the FBI, and starting to yeah. work undercover. You know, <clears throat> you know uh, my things. Um, you know, when I did my time in Cleveland, actually, I was there twice. I was there once as an agent of the uh, State Attorney General's Office, the uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Uh, they had an organized crime unit, and. Uh, it was run by a former FBI agent. So it was kind of set up like a mini FBI and uh, they had a separate organized crime unit. And um, I'd been on a, in local law enforcement after returning from Vietnam uh, back in uh, the early 1970s. And uh, so I applied and uh, got the job and, uh, and uh, 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 there I went. So uh, the hotbed of uh, OC activity at that time uh, for the most part in Ohio was Cleveland yep. and uh, Murray Hill, Murray Hill and uh, Mayfield. And it was the Murray Hill gang and uh, uh, Jack White, uh, also known as uh, uh, Licavoli. Uh, right. And, and uh, you know, they were rocking and rolling and uh, they caught the attention of everybody, uh, including mafiosa, you know, from New York and, and Chicago and uh, other areas where they were actually looking for help. Um, and, uh, to, uh, to, uh, solve some of these, um, issues and so forth. Uh, so anyway, uh, um, back in, I, I guess it must've been 1997 and, uh, I'm not sure exactly when Danny Green was, uh, blown up so, or murdered. So this, uh, Danny Green, the, the war lasted between 76 and 77 in 78 the two sides actually came together and made peace and started working with each other after Danny Green was out of the picture. Uh, but Danny Green declared war in like the summer of 76. He killed Jack Licavoli's underboss, uh, Leo Mosheri, Leo Lips Mosheri in August of 76. And then eventually Danny Green was blown up in, I believe, October of 77. Ah, Okay, so uh, I kind of entered the scene uh, in in Cleveland right around at the uh, after Danny Green was uh, blown up, killed, and as things were starting to try to try to stabilize, but they really didn't. <laughs> oh, no, there were still no. a lot of bodies dropping after Danny Green. Uh, died. Absolutely, I mean uh, Cleveland was just a crazy place, and their you know their favorite method of. Um, a murder course was uh, planting car bombs, and uh, uh, which eventually got Danny Green. I think he escaped it a couple times. Uh, yeah, he, couple he escaped, they they blew up his house. Uh, they they it wasn't even a fire bomb. They like they took down his whole house, and it was a two story house. And he somehow he was in bed with his girlfriend, and they because they were in bed somehow it prevented them from being killed. Like I think he house. Called- yeah. I think he called it the luck of the Irish, as I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so with that background, uh, that was all kind of going on, <clears throat> and the way I kind of uh, got involved in this um, was, uh, first of all, my undercover persona. I never pretended to be um, too much outside of what my natural uh, personality is, and uh, as you can see, I, you know, I don't look uh, 
if you can uh, um, kind of uh, identify what a mobster might look like or talk like. I didn't do any of those things. So I knew my limitations uh, undercover. I wasn't going to try to infiltrate and uh, become one of those guys. Uh, I'd be kind of a, uh, a trusted associate uh, would be my best. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> uh, the mainstay of the uh, mafia back in those days was illegal gambling, numbers, uh, sports gaming, uh, and uh, casino operations. And uh, one of the uh, main characters in Cleveland uh, was this teamster by the name of Jackie Presser. Uh, Presser. I'm sure you know about Jackie Presser. He was, the, I mean, he was more than just a, a Cleveland figure. He became the president of uh, all the whole teamsters. That's right. That's right. He was a big, uh, he also was an FBI informant, which right. I didn't know at that. Point. And um, I think ultimately, uh, wasn't he, uh, I think he was killed. Um, no, he wasn't, he wasn't killed, but um, he, he was, he was outed. I mean, people knew it. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, he took down, a, he, he, he took down a lot of people and, and his, uh, he was in the middle of all of this. Danny Green stuff because of the fact that the mafia had their hold uh, of the Teamsters Union. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, the uh, the U.S. Department of Labor um, uh, had an investigation on him, of course. And uh, one of the special agents uh, uh, was uh, cooperating or uh, had some dialogue with uh, BCI, my state agency. And um, the, the guy that uh, the case agent on the Jack Jackie Presser case for the Department of Labor was a former DEA agent, and we had worked some cases with him uh, successfully. And uh, so uh, he asked us, uh, the uh, BCI, uh, to uh, go into a gambling operation. It was a huge kind of a casino craps operation that uh, they had just in one of the uh, Cleveland uh, suburbs. I think it was in um, uh, Brookfield or uh, one of those uh, nearby uh, areas. And uh, so I guess you, you actually had to have a recommendation. You had to have uh, some tickets to this uh, big event. It was very exclusive. And it was held at, I think, at a uh, Holiday Inn. So at the appointed time, uh, my partner and I, uh, Kitty Havanick, who, uh, by the way, kind of looked like a little uh, Irishman, uh, which I'll explain later on, uh, didn't work so well for us. And... Uh, <clears throat> So anyway, uh, we went into this game, and it was being operated by a well-known uh, Cleveland uh, mob associate, two of them, a guy by the name of Joe Spagnola, a.k.a. Spags, Joe Spags, mm -hmm. and another guy by the name of George R.G., uh, Gigi. Uh, Gigi. He just, he, R.I.P. Gigi. He just died a couple months ago. Ah, uh, God bless him. He wasn't a bad guy, as I remember. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of uh, mafioso. Right, but, right. But uh, we went in, we had, uh, of course, uh, funds available to us, and uh, we spent a lot of money, and uh, Gigi liked that. And uh, so he invited us uh, to an exclusive uh, gambling operation in uh, Geauga County, just outside of Cleveland, a place called uh, Pineway Trails. And uh, it, was, uh, this, it was a resort that essentially was owned and run uh, by the mob and their associates. And... Uh, uh, at least once a week, uh, they had a big casino night. And uh, again, it was very exclusive. Uh, it was by uh, invitation only. Uh, and so uh, I guess we fit the bill. So <clears throat> we began going. And I'll never forget, uh, you know, the when you would arrive there, uh, they had a special parking area that was probably 100 yards uh, from where the casino operation was. And so you had to park your vehicle and then you would be given a ride down to the casino operation and so forth. And uh, so we went in and uh, parked our uh, undercover vehicle and uh, uh, we got into another vehicle, which ironically was uh, driven by, this, again, this is back in the day when some of these uh, mobsters were trying to make their bones. And it was um, actually, uh, we were given rides back and forth by Joe Ikebachi. I think it was Joe. Oh, yeah. Joe, Joe Luce, who eventually Joe, became the boss. Right. Joe Luce eventually worked his way up to the be the boss. And another guy that was prominent there uh, was a guy by the name of Tony Del Monte, uh, yeah. who uh, 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 I guess got into cocaine and, uh, and uh, it 
eventually became an FBI informant. I understand later he on. Ta- he ta- uh, I think he taped an induction ceremony up in Rochester uh, oh, in the yeah, late yeah. 90s yeah. where he was going to be inducted into the Rochester Mafia. I think Tommy Murata was going to do it, and he was he was uh, taping it. Well, uh, those guys. But, but in the seventies, he was a Cleveland guy. Yeah, yeah, he was a Cleveland guy, and uh, these guys were trying to make their bones and uh, so forth. So, uh, so we started going to this place, and um, and uh, we were just. Uh, uh, I guess our, our number one mission was to uh, just develop an intel and uh, who was running it. Uh, what was happening, and that at some point uh, we would get together with uh, perhaps the FBI or local authorities, and uh, we would uh, determine a, a course of action uh, to be taken. So we be, began uh, going there uh, for a number of months, at least once a week, maybe even over a period of years. And so we became uh, somewhat uh, familiar people. And, uh, you, you know, I had the you know, way back when, when I first got into uh, BCI, you know, I had to learn how to, uh, uh, you know, how to sports bet. And uh, I had to learn some of the casino games. And um, I had, of course, you know, craps was uh, the big game. And I, I think it still is, you know, in some of these illegal operations. And so I not only learned how to play craps, later on, I actually had to learn how to deal it, which is a completely uh, different operation. And it all kind of came together because eventually at the end of my FBI career, I ended up as uh, chief of security at one of the big hotels. Right, casino. That's how. That's when I met you. That you were running security for yeah, for, yeah. And, and on the strip. So it all kind of fit. But uh, uh, going back to it, um, uh, we became somewhat trusted, uh, trusted as you know, gamblers and just uh, knock around guys and uh, and fun loving guys. And uh, we had heard uh, through our intel that down on Murray Hill. Uh, the Italians had this big barboot game. It's a, uh, you may be familiar with it. Uh, yeah, it's barboot's a, like a, a Greek, it's like a Greek dice game. That's right. It's a Mediterranean, uh, the origins, I think, are a Greek game. It's a dice game. And uh, and uh, uh, it was actually being run right down on Murray Hill, uh, right in the enclave of uh, Jack White. And uh, yeah, you know, he was uh, receiving direct benefits from this thing. and. Uh, so <clears throat> when we would go to this operation, uh, I would uh, let it be known that I was interested in playing bar boot. And uh, I couldn't find a good game anyplace. And we, we were well established at that point as, uh, you know, serious gamblers. And uh, there was a guy, a uh, young guy, he was an associate, one of these guys. I don't even remember, remember his name. And uh, his ears perked up. And he said, you know what? We got a game. It's very exclusive. It's right down on uh, Mayfield. and." Uh, and Murray Hill, and uh, I'll set it up so you guys can go in there, okay? I said, yeah, great. He said, meet me at a bar called Birdie's, and it was right at the intersection of Mayfield and uh, Murray Hill. <clears throat> so uh, we went down at the appointed time, and uh, Kenny uh, Havanek, again, he's got this kind of reddish hair and a few freckles, and uh, we're you know just a couple young guys. And uh, so we show up, and we walk into this bar, and it's a mob bar. We had no intel on the place. Uh, we walk in, the bartender looks at me, and he's looking at me really hard, and especially looking at Kenny. And uh, and the guys in there are looking at us, too. And, you know, we're getting an uneasy feeling. So <clears throat> I said, uh, the guy said, uh, what do you want? I said, uh, I want a Paps. He said, we don't got any. I said, uh, how about a Miller? We ain't got that either. So I went down the list. I said, what kind of bar are you people running here? He said, a bar that doesn't include you. I went, damn. So right about that time, this young guy uh, that invited us down to the bar boot game and was going to arrange it, came in and he's huffing and puffing, his face is red. He said, get out of here, come here. And so we went on the street. He said, what are you guys doing? I said, well, we're here to meet you, like you said. And he said, I said, what's the problem with these guys? He said, they think you're from Danny Green's crew. And they're, they're, uh, you know, they're putting together a package here to, you know, take care of you guys. He said, my God, you shouldn't have gone in there. I said, well, you didn't say it. You said to meet you there. So, so anyway, we end up. Just to um, give some, just to give some context real quick. So Danny Green is killed uh, in 77. 
and his group was called the Celtic Club, That's aka right. the Irish Mob. But the guys that were left, you know, they they were pragmatic about it. And yeah, guys like Ke Kevin McTaggart uh, right. and Keith Keith Ritson were kind of the two leaders, uh, and they made a deal with with Licavoli, uh to come together. And one of the things they came together on was this Barbu game that was in right in the, the epicenter in, in Murray Hill. And about a year into this arrangement or six months into this arrangement, there were worries from the East side Italians that Ritson and McTaggart were feigning interest in uh, becoming a partnership but had their eyes on killing them. And, and that was true when it came to Ritson, but it wasn't true when it came to McTaggart. And this culminates in them, the, the Italians telling McTaggart and his group, you got to kill Ritson. <laughs> and they did. And, and Keith Ritson was killed in, in 78. But that I believe that what you're talking about came right in the middle of this, where they had already started the Barboot game. They were... All, Everything was copacetic. And then rumors started to come out that Ritson, who was in the middle of these Barboot games, was actually planning on killing Licavoli. And they started to worry that the old Danny Green guys were actually had an adversarial posture to them. So we're I think used, you got you. We could have used you as an analyst. Or right. <laughs> right. You know the stuff better than I do. Right. Uh, but um, uh, yeah, that Barboot game, uh, I guess, was central. Uh, Big and, a bit, and it made a lot of money. It did. So at the appointed time and night, uh, we went down. We uh, The guy took, takes us in. And I'll never forget it. It's one of these old uh, Cleveland homes, you know. And uh, they have these rickety old basements, you know, that are well over 100 years old at the time. And uh, they uh, the door was, uh, they had a, a great big barrier on the door. <clears throat> and so we knocked. Uh, we were let in. And I'll never forget, this is funny. Uh, I walk in, there's some old uh, Italian guys, some mob associates, and they're sitting watching TV and they're watching Ephraim Zembles Jr. on the FBI. Uh, mm -hmm. The FBI. And they're going, look at that bastard, what an asshole. And uh, I can't believe that prick. You can't, he's and, they're, and so I'm sitting there with these guys and I'm watching this thing. And I'm thinking, how ironic is this? You know? <laughs> it's art imitating life. Yeah. So uh, eventually we were led down into this uh, old rickety basement where they had the bar boot game uh, ongoing. And we went down. Of course, we were getting a lot of hard looks because we were from the neighborhood. Uh, we really didn't have uh, – uh, uh, the only bona fides we had was this guy that introduced us. And uh, apparently he was good enough to, to do that. And so we went down there. We did our thing and identified, <clears throat> you know, some of the uh, culprits that were there and so forth. And then <clears> – <throat> Uh, eventually that game kind of broke up and it, it you know, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying. It may have had something to do with, um, uh, you know, the stuff that was going on with Danny Green's yeah. whole crew. So. And then but, I think that then they split it into East side, the, that game in the, in Murray Hill, I think went away. And then they had a East side and a West side game that they were kind of operating separately, but still sharing uh, in the, in the pooling of profits. You know, it was interesting about this uh, Pineway Trails uh, operation uh, where they had the big gambling operation. At that time, again, I'm a state agent at that point, and um, uh, we didn't realize it. Uh, we had reached out to the Bureau, uh, the FBI, a number of times saying, hey, we got this going on, and uh, it's all these wise guys, and um, you guys should be involved with us. And uh, they uh, more or less strung us along. But what we didn't know, is that they did have an operation ongoing, and it involved the sheriff of Geauga County, who uh, was an undercover FBI informant at the time, and uh, he was getting paid off and uh, taking bribes uh, on behalf of the government. And uh, of course, they were uh, the FBI at that time was a little upset that we were in there. We might muck things up a little bit. So, uh, but anyway, we worked it out eventually, and it all came out uh, later on. And ironically. Years later, uh, when I uh, became an FBI agent, I ended up back in Cleveland on a public corruption case uh, run by the Cleveland office. 
uh, with some gangsters and so forth. And uh, we ended up opening a small casino and uh, where basically the target of it was um, uh, corrupt police officers who were protecting uh, operations, uh, gambling operations in Cleveland. And uh, they had a great undercover agent by the name of uh, Ray Morrow. Uh, and I uh, went down and hooked up with him. And uh, I had I, I brought an old inform, you know, informant with me. And I think you know this guy. Um, he's deceased now. And um, I brought him down from uh, Detroit, where I was assigned at the time. And uh, he gave me instant uh, credibility with all these uh, bad guys down there. And his name was Ernie Kanakis. Hey, all right. Ernie the Greek. Who, yeah. Uh, survived multiple attempts on his life. Um, lived to tell about it. Uh, he, he, was, he was quite the, uh, the story of Ernie the Greek is pretty fascinating. Just a quick digression. <laughs> uh, he was a guy that worked for the Detroit Italian mob. Um, for a short period of time, or was kind of an independent guy who ran a pretty successful gambling operation um, right. at, out of a, a hotel in the Cass Corridor in Detroit, which was called the Eddystone. And it became so big that it attracted the attention of the Italians who came and told him that, hey, by the way, now you have some new partners. Um, and uh, he... I guess he went along for a period of time and then eventually tried to disconnect from them. They decided to murder him. This is a pretty infamous case in Detroit. It was the, it was the week of July 4th, 1976. Uh, it's, a lot of people refer to it as the bicentennial bloodbath around here, uh, <laughs> where they three, three Detroit mafia lieutenants that were all made guys that were actually all in their like late sixties, early seventies, which even I think which is, then, is old old now, but back then it was even older. That's right. Uh, these kind I of geriatric, the geriatric yeah, hit of uh, Nick Dita and Nick another, Dita, yeah, and Randozo and uh, some other guy. I can't, can't yeah, recall. Yeah, Nick Dita, who was kind of a legendary hitman in the Midwest. Um, Frankie Randazzo, who ran all the porn and sex rackets in Detroit. And then another guy, Joe Siragusa, um, and they lured him to Randazzo's house, and he they take him down to the basement, and they jump him. Uh, wh one guy starts ice picking him, and then another guy comes. I think it was Ditta, and puts a gun to his head and pulls the trigger, but he had made a makeshift silencer which jammed the gun. Kanakis has a piece in his in uh, in a holster on his on his. Uh, Ankle, he pulls the pulls the gun, shoots all three guys. Kills two him. of them, two of them die immediately. He gets out of he gets out of there. Two of them die immediately. Nick Ditta is such a badass. He cl he climbs from the basement to the kitchen. It's not his house, remember? It's Randazzo's house. Right. He calls 911. They say, Where are you? He says, I don't, I don't know. The address, he climbs or he, he crawls outside, gets the address, crawls back inside, tells them the address. And when the ambulance gets there, he's dead with the phone, the phone clutched to his ear. It looked like Kanakis got away with it. He, he put on trial, is, is uh, acquitted on self-defense, looks like all's forgiven. And then like 10 years later, the Jackaloni brothers... Tony and Billy Jackaloni, who were the you know the street bosses of the Detroit Mafia, I remember the case well. Yeah, uh, they tell one of their lieutenants, a guy named Frank the Bomb Bomberito, who I I got to know pretty well at the end of his life. Oh, uh, that um, they they want Kanakis murdered, and the bomb is told that. Not only should he murder them, but he should put a picture of the dead body in a Christmas card and send it to the Jackalones. Uh, it ends up, they, the bomb ends up contracting it to a guy named Charlie Acker, who happens Boy, to be working. You got a memory, man. Right. You got a memory, I'll tell you. It's amazing. He was working for the FBI. So the, the hitman that the mob hired to do it is working for the FBI. Um, and Kanakis survives again. 
he ends up gets ends up getting a pass after that and goes to Las Vegas, and I believe he died. You know. Yeah, yeah. We're actually uh, Ernie and I hooked up again, but uh, but uh, boy, you got that right down to you know. Yeah. <clears throat> It was interesting. Uh, I don't know if you ever uh, had an opportunity to actually speak directly with Ernie. No, I didn't. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, as a side note, um, Ernie uh, became a very, very productive um, informant, you know, for the FBI uh, after that assassination attempt. And I handled him for many, many years. And at one point, <clears throat> uh, FBI headquarters, uh, uh, Quantico, asked, you know, they had a like an informant development uh, 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 thing going on in service. And so they asked me to come down and ask whether or not Ernie would go to the F to uh, Quantico to make a presentation. And uh, so I talked to Ernie. He said, yeah, yeah, they're going to pay for it. I said, yeah, they'll pay for it. So Ernie and I get on a plane. We go down to uh, Quantico. And the guy was like a superstar. You know, he's telling his story. And uh, these people were fascinated. And uh, and uh, he was uh, just a huge success. But uh, Ernie was very in, uh, uh, enamored with the with the whole situation. And while we were there, uh, did he have uh, did he have connect? He had connections to the Cleveland guys that he could take you there and be like, "This is so and so," and I'm vouching for these guys. He did. He was window dressing for me uh, okay. because you know I had no real uh, background and so forth. But when Ernie was questioned. Uh, uh, he could take these people back to, you know, 40 years in Detroit right. and talk about the connections and everything. So yeah, it gave Detroit, me there's a ton of connections between Detroit and Cleveland. The two guys right. that were leading Cleveland in, in the 70s, Mo Sherry and Licavoli, were originally Detroit. Exactly. And so he gave me instant credibility. Uh, so uh, the case became incredibly uh, successful. I mean, uh, uh, Ray Morrow really was uh, kind of the, the undercover FBI agent, was really the star of this operation. I kind of had a supporting role. It was an important role. Uh, but eventually, I think uh, like uh, 40 corrupt police officers were arrested, and, and uh, I think the majority of them pled guilty uh, to accepting bribes. We had a lot of people on the payroll. Not, uh, to, not to digress again, but to, I just want to give Herm his proper due, uh, because not only was he a mob buster going undercover, um, but he just mentioned the corruption case uh, that he that he worked in Cleveland. But in Detroit, we, we don't have to go into it. But his right. operation backbone in Detroit, uh, he took down a dirty cop uh, ring in Detroit. That was the biggest bust of uh, corrupt Detroit police officers. Uh, you know, it, the biggest bust probably in, in, in the department's history. And, so. uh, and and Herm, it was literally. Herm quarterback that thing from day one, uh, and and it, and, it, and as big as it was, it could have been bigger. He Absolutely. he had some bigger fish uh, on the line that it didn't end up uh, getting them. But uh, so Herm is 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 you know deserves the props for that. I want oh. you know, as we finish up here, I want to hit on two things. First, it, it's also of note when we're talking about the 1970s in Cleveland that. Danny, DeGre Danny Green, while on one hand leading this insurgence and is this very high profile Irish mob don, he's also a confidential informant for the FBI. He was. Right? Yeah. So it's like, and you, obviously people didn't know that at the time. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, hats off to the Bureau back in those days. I mean, they were really kicking ass. I mean, uh, they had Jimmy the Weasel that eventually became uh, yeah, uh, a yeah. Cleveland guy. And uh, Jackie Presser, of course, we already talked about. And, uh, um, and well, the, Angie Leonardo, who was the <laughs> underboss after Mosheri's killed, he becomes the first American, even though he was acting, uh, he became the first boss or acting boss of an American Lacosa Nostra family to uh, to flip. Right. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's interesting to me how all these things uh, become uh, interconnected. Uh, it's almost karma in uh, a lot of ways, yeah. speaking of karma. Uh, so the last thing ahead. I'll ask you um, when we finish this up is, you okay? Sorry, <laughs> apologize to the audience. Um, so bringing it into modern times, I want to get your take on Kevin McTaggart 
arguably the number two uh, in charge of that Irish mob group, um, the right hand of Danny Green. It's been in prison since 1982 or 83, uh, serving a life sentence. There's been a movement over the last year or two by some prominent members of uh, the Cleveland uh, legal community, political community, as well as some celebrities uh, that are championing his release uh, with a, uh, um, not a medical, but a, a compassionate release. Right. Uh, I, know, I know Bernie Kosar, the former quarterback of the Cleveland Browns, has offered, has told the judge that he, that he would house Kevin McTaggart. He could come live in his house. What do, what's your take on that? A, does he deserve to come out after someone that was in, involved in so many murders and convicted of, of murders? Um, and what's your take on that? There's some very prominent lawyers and politicians as well as celebrities that are campaigning. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you see this happening um, a lot of times. You saw it in the white boy Rick case. Um, yeah. uh, he gained some celebrity and uh, you see it with the... Um, with the Native American uh, that uh, murdered uh, three FBI agents, can yeah. we call it? Yes, yes. Uh, so you wounded see, knee. wounded knee, wounded knee, and so you see these cases come up, and um, they're backed by celebrities, and they really minimize, you know, what these people actually did, and they kind of gloss over it and uh, paint them really as victims of the circumstances and victims of the time, and. Uh, they were doing it for survival purposes. But the bottom line is, uh, in, a, in the case of Kevin McTaggart, he whacked a lot of people ruthlessly. Yep. Yep. Uh, and uh, he was doing it for power and for money. And uh, back in the old days, they used to execute people for that. So, yeah, I, I believe in second chances. But in cases like that, I don't. I think he needs to stay where he is. And I think these celebrities and these big shot uh, political figures or whomever, I think uh, they just need to go find somebody that uh, actually deserves their attention. That's what I think. Well, thank you, Herm. Uh, I appreciate you taking us down memory lane in Cleveland. This was fun. Uh, we're going to have Herm back on very soon. We're going to talk about his undercover work in Los Angeles, where he, again, another one of these heads on his wall or accolades on his resume. You could pretty much trace the entire downfall of the Los Angeles mafia to uh, her, part of Herm Groman's uh, operation upper, was it called upper crust? Uh, thin crust. Thin, thin crust, uh, right. where they uh, were able to flip the underboss of the uh, LA mafia, uh, Carm right. uh, Carmen Milano. So we're gonna talk about that next time. Uh, Herm, thank you a lot. Thank you very much for joining us. Sure, um, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for the pat on the back, but uh, you know, my wife wants me to take out the garbage. So, no, well, your 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 uh, your stories deserve to be told because it, people <laughs> like yourself. I mean, I'm, it's true. Uh, I you're true American heroes, and and uh, those stories are just as important as stories that are more heralded. But these things sure. sometimes fall through the cracks, and right. uh, but that they're they're amazing amazing stories, and, and and you're someone that we owe a debt to. So, thank you, Herman. Uh, for uh, OG Pod, I'm Scott Bernstein. We'll see you next week.